so um, we, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Gary Kanush. He's a, uh, a colleague of mine here at, in Denver. And uh, I would venture to say that yesterday he probably saw more neuroendocrine scans than he may have seen his whole career. So it's gotten to the point where uh, our people, and, and you'll meet them and please say hello to them, are really very well versed in neuroendocrine. And that, that's one of the things I think that's important as, as Dr. Ramirez kind of pointed out, is that when you come to a specialty center, the, uh, you really want everyone to be aware of it. So it starts with, you know, obviously us, the experts, but also the radiologists, the pathologists, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, the, uh, the, the cooks in the cafeteria. I mean, everyone's familiar with it. And that's, that's the kind of comfort you want when you come to have your surgery or to have your care or, or, or the nurses when they give you your Sando or injection or whatever it is. So it's that kind of confidence that you really want and the, the kind of information we're trying to spread across the country. So it's my pleasure to produce, uh, to introduce Gary Kanuji. He's gonna talk about radiology in neuroendocrine. Thank you, good morning. Uh, glad to see everybody here. Eric, thanks for having me. You can tell I'm a radiologist because I'm probably the most casually dressed speaker you'll see today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the imaging of pulmonary uh, neuroendocrine tumors. My name is pronounced Gnuch. It rhymes with Butch. It's very confusing to try to pronounce that. Um, there's my email address. Feel free to contact me if you have questions about the talk, about any scans that may have been read in our system. You'll see my name on reports from Rose, Rocky Mountain Cancer Center, and PSL. And in addition to me, you may see um, the names of some of my partners. These are the four that Together with me, we read most of the studies. Uh, Dr. Kemp, Sardi, Cornbluth, and Gerald. And so now you have some faces to put along with those names on the reports. I'm gonna review some of the major types of pulmonary neural endocrine uh, imaging that we do. And we'll go through each tumor type quickly and I'll make some comments about the various imaging modalities. Let's start with the workhorse of uh, oncology imaging nowadays, CT scans. Um, CT is very in, uh, helpful in the initial detection and establishing um, the stage and in monitoring response to therapy and after therapy is complete in uh, surveillance for recurrence or metastatic disease. The image on your left-hand side shows you a um, CT gantry with the housing taken off. And we produce CTs with um, a tube that generates x-rays that flow through the patient as the patient's moving through the gantry and they're detected by a row of detectors. Those x-rays are attenuated by your tissues. Each organ, each tissue attenuates the beam differently. As that beam, as you move through this gantry, those detectors and the tube is spinning around you at a very high fast rate. That's what the noise is when you're laying on the table. I was going to show you a video clip of what that looks like, but I can't do it in this room. So if you go to YouTube and Google CT spinning, you'll come up with at least a dozen uh, video images and you can take a look for yourself. It's really kind of fascinating if you've never seen it. The cartoon on the right shows us that as the patient is passing through the um, gantry, we're acquiring data in a spiral fashion. And the data nowadays is uh, high enough resolution that we're able to do some pretty fancy spectacular manipulations and we can produce images like these. Um, we can isolate the skeletal system, various organs like the heart. Here's the aorta and the coronary arteries. Here we've isolated the lungs. We can do angiograms. Um, these images, in addition to just being beautiful, can help us conceptualize tumor in your body, where it's located, what organs are involved, and uh, the blood supply. It can help Dr. Liu determine his surgical approach. Just to be sure that we're all oriented, most of the images I'm going to show you are axial images. We're looking at the patient as they're lying down from the feet towards the head, so the patient's right-hand side is on your left, the patient's left-hand side is on your right, the front or anterior part of the body is at the top of the screen and the back is posteriorly. We're going to run through DIPNAC, neuroendocrine cell proliferation, imaging of carcinoids, small and large cell tumors. 
Diffuse idiopathic neurocrine, neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNAP, is a pre-evasive lesion. It can give rise to carcinoids. Uh, patients can be asymptomatic. Sometimes we detect this on CT that is done for other reasons. Or they can present with chronic cough and shortness of breath. I'm going to sneak in a pathology slide in here before our next speaker. It's my only one. And uh, I'll try not to make a fool of myself, but what this is supposed to be showing us, and I'm not a pathologist, is that these neuroendocrine uh, cells are lining this airway and narrowing the airway. The white area in the center is a narrowed lumen. So the cells form little tumorlets that on CT we can see as small nodules. These can be just a few millimeters in size. And they constrict the bronchus, as in this example, and give rise to constrictive bronchiolitis, which on CT manifests as air traffic in the airway. So here's a fancy 3D manipulation, axial projection of a patient uh, with dip neck. And you can see how with this 3D manipulation on a single image, we can follow normal blood vessels through their entire course as they're branching uh, through the lung parenchyma. And we use this technique to detect lung nodules because, as you can see in this uh, example, these nodules, these tiny little um, foci here in the lung, are not much bigger than the adjacent vessel. And so on a typical axial scan, we can overlook them. We might think we're looking at vessels. This projection technique allows us to pick these lesions out, and this is what we see with dip neck. Usually not this many nodules, but um, that's an example of a pathologically proven case. And as I said, it can cause constrictive bronchiolitis. We see that on uh, CAT scan manifested as areas of air trapping, and that's these areas here on the scan that are lower in density than the higher density areas adjacent to it. Dipneck can also um, present on CT with changes of bronchial dilatation or bronchiectasis, thickening of the airway, and it can obstruct the bronchi and cause atelectasis, and it can cause uh, air to become trapped in the lung and it can't get out, a ball valve type mechanism that um, we see, the slide didn't, there we go, uh, show up as tiny little cysts, and I can't see it from this position, but the black arrows on here are pointing to small lung cysts caused by the uh, tumor nodules. Um, these findings aren't really very specific. They're suggestive of the diagnosis, but you still need to get tissue. Things that can mimic the uh, appearance that I've shown you, pulmonary metastatic disease and infection. And we really can't tell for sure what we're looking at without biopsy. World Health Organization classifies neuroendocrine tumors into three grades, four types. Talk a little bit about the imaging of carcinoid, large cell and small cell tumors. Carcinoid is divided into typical and atypical variants of low and intermediate grade, and the other two tumors are higher grade. Pulmonary neuroendocrine tumor, as was stated previously, uh, accounts for about a quarter of invasive lung cancers. Most invasive lung cancers, of course, are adenocarcinomas. The majority of the pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors are small cell cancers. The remaining tumor types of neuroendocrine tumor account for only about 5% of the primary lung cancer. So let's start with carcinoid. Carcinoid can occur in various places in your body. We commonly see it in uh, intestine, pancreas. About a third of them occur in the respiratory tract. They account for about 2% or less of all primary lung tumors, and most are the typical variety. If the uh, lesion is centrally located and involves a bronchus, as in this patient who has a big mass and his left main stem bronchus, it can lead to symptoms. Infection, cough, bleeding, wheezing, and um, if the tumors are small, not related to a bronchus, or peripherally located, they can be incidental. We only detect them incidentally on a CT done for another reason. Sometimes patients present with perineoplastic syndromes, namely Cushing and carcinoid, and we're occasionally asked to image those patients to detect either a primary tumor or metastatic disease to the liver. Carcinoid usually shows up on CT as a well-defined mass centrally located. Here's one in a patient in the left lung. It's obstructing the left um, bronchus, and this left lung is collapsed. This is all collapsed lung distal to the obstructing tumor. Usually we see a solitary mass measuring about two to five centimeters, and 
um, we're seeing an increasing number of these now peripherally with the use of CT scanning. These have a variable relationship to the bronchus. They can be completely endoluminal, like the case I showed a moment ago. They can be partially endoluminal, where we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in the, in the bronchus itself. And they can be uh, outside of the bronchus, and the bronchus can run into it. Here's a couple of examples. This patient here, bronchus runs into the mass. That's called the bronchus sign, and the airway distal to it is less dense because air is being trapped. This patient has a central tumor and also tumor that's grown out more peripherally. Here's an example of the tip of the iceberg sign. So the arrows are pointing to a small endobronchial component, but most of the tumor is actually in the lung parenchyma or distally. These tumors, since they involve the airway, the airway can become dilated, mucus can become impacted, the airway can become obstructed, we can have atelectasis or air trapping distal to it. Sometimes the uh, tumors exhibit calcification. This um, CT is windowed so the lung is black and we're seeing soft tissue a little bit better. We can differentiate bone from muscle and fat and we can see that this large mass in this patient's right central lung has calcium in it. We know this is calcium because the density is nearly the same as that of bone. We look for metastatic disease, namely spread to lymph nodes, liver, bone, adrenal glands. Atypical carcinoids tend to present um, with metastasis. They're more aggressive tumors. They tend to be larger at time of presentation, and they're often more peripherally located. As in dip neck, we establish diagnosis by biopsy, even though CT can be very suggestive of the diagnosis. And the CT can help us determine which is the best approach, whether it's bronchoscopy, percutaneous CT guided biopsy, or a lung resection. Here's an example of a that patient I showed earlier with whoops with um, the obstructing I'm having a little bit of trouble here with my pointer. So there's the mass, bronchus runs into it, the airways uh, trapping air uh, in the lung distal. Here's a PET CT on this patient, and it shows that the uptake, which is the orange um, on the CT scan, is about the same or maybe less than in the blood pool of this patient. So here's the tumor, and here's normal uptake in the blood pool, in the heart, the aorta, the pulmonary arteries. This is another patient here with a tumor in the left lower lobe, and we can see that really the uptake here is almost nothing. It's certainly less than in the blood pool. And I've got one more example of a carcinoid on PET-CT here. This was an incidental lung nodule. The patient went to PET-CT to try to determine whether this was benign or malignant, and you can see it takes up really no of the FDG. So this is a false negative, and that's a problem with PET-CT in carcinoid tumors. They're not usually very aggressive or metabolically um, active on PET, and so we're misled into thinking um, that they're benign if they're incidental nodules, but that's not always the case. Here's an example of one that is very metabolically active. This is the aorta, and the uptake in the blood pool is clearly much, much less than in this large mass that shows calcification on the CT. So what can we say about F18 and FDG PET? Its sensitivity is low for many neuroendocrine tumors. It's more useful in the aggressive, poorly differentiated ones. We have a new gallium agent that I'm going to talk about at the end. Uh, that is much more sensitive to FDG PET, and we'll be starting to use that, I believe, this summer in this practice. And there's also a uh, somatostatin analog that we are currently using called uh, indium-111 octreotide, and we'll talk about that. So the take-home message, FDG for carcinoid has a high false negative rate. What about MR? We can use MR. Uh, MR has several advantages over CT. There's no radiation. Um, it has superior contrast resolution, which means we detect more lesions in organs than we do on CAT scan. CT is superior in the lung. We can see little nodules in the lung as small as two millimeters. MR is really much better, usually, in the liver. And we use um, what we call multiperimetric scanning. When you go through the MR scanner, we scan your liver multiple times using different techniques to give us different sets of information about the liver. 
The problem with MR is it's very motion sensitive. It's sensitive to normal physiologic motion. It degrades the image quality. So your breathing, movement of the diaphragm, uh, just intestinal peristalsis and beating of the heart degrades the image quality. Most of the degradation, though, occurs from you if you move. MRs are difficult. I've had many, and they get harder as you get older. Uh, it's hard to lay in that little um, tomb for 30 minutes or so. And it, the noise is very loud. It's very difficult to stay comfortable. So if you move during the scan, the image degradation can really interfere with our ability to accurately interpret what's going on. In general, carcinoid tumors are high signal intensity. That means they're bright on images that are sensitive to water. They show intense enhancement. We do dynamic contrast enhancement. We inject intravenous gadolinium agents. Then we image your liver multiple times. We try to time the images so that we're scanning the liver when it's being enhanced, when there's blood flowing into it that has the gadolinium agent in, in it. So the arteries are enhanced and the portal vein is enhanced. But before the hepatic veins are enhanced so that those that enhanced blood is not yet flowing out of the liver. Then we image you again later, about 40 seconds or so later, to uh, catch that phase where the hepatic veins, the, the blood that's enhanced that's exiting the liver, uh, shows up. And then we image you again at a later time when things are starting to wash out, and then much later, several minutes later. This allows us to characterize lots of lesions that aren't carcinoid nets, like mangiomas, small cysts, focal nodular hyperplasia, a whole host of lesions, and we're much more accurate in doing that in MR than, than in CT in general. In fact, a lot of little tiny ditzels, little tiny low-density lesions on CT, we have to throw our hands up and say we really don't know if these are tumor mats that are small and will grow in the future or not. But on MR, we're usually able to tell you whether they're just small cysts and can be ignored. Here's an example of an octreotide scan. This patient, uh, we've scanned through the liver. Um, in its lower portion, this is the top of the kidneys. This bright area here is a tumor, a metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor in the left lobe. When we do an MR on this patient using diffusion weighting, we see multiple additional lesions that we can't detect on that octreotide scan. Diffusion weighted imaging is kind of interesting. I don't have much time to go into physics, but it's basically based on the motion of water molecules in your, in your tissue. So in normal tissue, the water molecules can move around a lot more freely than they can in a tumor that is a densely, densely packed with cells, very hypercellular. So the motion, we say, is restricted. So we use diffusion to try to detect that. And we do two uh, sets of images, and we create what's called an ADC map, a apparent diffusion coefficient map. And I want you to look at one of these lesions here, this larger one in the left lobe. And as I go to the next scan, we're going to move from this diffusion sequence to the ADC map. You can see that that uh, tumor has lost signal compared to the liver. So we say that it has restricted diffusion. That's what we're looking for. And that's true of all those other little small tumors, though I can't really point them out from this angle. And that is uh, actually the most sensitive uh, imaging that we have right now for detecting liver metastasis. We also find a lot of benign lesions that way, so we have to correlate it with the other phases of the scan to be sure we're looking at tumor. The other use for the diffusion weighting is shown in this patient who presents on this CT, or excuse me, MR contrast enhanced with a mass in the dome of the liver. It shows a lot of enhancement peripherally with central necrosis. This lesion grew over time. The patient was treated. During therapy, before the lesion stopped enhancing and before it shrunk in size, we see a change on the ADC map. The lesion is still bright on diffusion, but it, be, it stays bright on the ADC map. On prior scans, this was dark on the ADC map. That's telling us that this lesion is responding. And that's usually the first indication that we have, even before tumors shrink or before their enhancement changes. Here's another example, Indium 111 scan on the top left. This is the SPECT portion. This is the um, planar portion. We see a couple of masses in the right lobe. We see them on the T1 weighted MRI image, but notice on this contrast enhanced image, we're picking up multiple additional lesions that we really can't see on the indium and that are very difficult to see before contrast. That same patient, when we do the diffusion scanning, we pick up additional lesions here in the left and right lobe that are bright on T1, dark on T2. 
These are not visible on any of the other sequences that we did on this patient. So the diffusion is picking up additional lesions that we don't see anywhere else. We can also use MR to detect metastatic disease to the heart. Some carcinoid uh, patients will uh, get into trouble with uh, heart metastasis, and this is an example showing uptake on a delayed contrast image in the tricuspid valve. Moving on to large cell tumors, these are more aggressive, um, tend to be older patients, smokers. They present as large peripheral masses with necrosis. They usually have um, adenopathy and often have pleural effusions associated. Here's an example. CT scan on the left showing a large mass. The bright branching structures are vessels that are encased by the tumor. And here is a PET CT, blood pool activity much, much less than the activity in this tumor. So you can see in these more aggressive tumors, PET-CT is much more useful. Um, small cell cancers, also more invasive, uh, tend to present with adenopathy and distant metastasis. The patients, again, are smokers, and um, usually we see a large central mass involving the mediastinum or hilum, either the right or left side. Here's an example. Coronal image, so now we're looking at the patient face on. So here's the trachea, right and left main stem bronchi. There's a large central mass here involving the lung, compressing the bronchus, involving the mediastinum. Here it is on a sagittal image. We're looking from the side. We see both the tumor and the com completely collapsed lung distal to it. Here's another case, a small cell, large central mediastinal mass, bronchial compression, metabolic uh, active lymph node in the anterior mediastinum, very metabolically active tumor. The arrow is pointing to a compressed superior vena cava. And these tumors um, tend to present more commonly with uh, paraneoplastic syndromes than the other tumors that we've talked about. TNM staging was mentioned in the previous talk. How is PET-CT helpful in that? PET-CT can change the staging in up to 30% of patients, and that's why it's used. Um, it helps us in the T-staging, the tumor staging portion, to distinguish what is tumor. Here's a CT scan showing collapsed lung and central tumor with the heart mediastinum shifted onto the left hemithorax. There it is on the PET. We can better get an idea of how much of that is tumor and how much of it is collapsed lung than we can on the CT. Nodal staging. CT is not very good for detecting accurately characterizing whether a lymph nodes have metastatic disease. We use size. If the lymph node's too big, we say it's positive. But a lot of lymph nodes that are normal in size can have metastasis to them, and many enlarged lymph nodes are enlarged because they're reactive, they're inflamed, and they contain no tumor. That CT is much more accurate. Um, it upstages patients, as I said, in about 30% of the time. And uh, you can see an example here of normal sized lymph nodes showing increased uptake compared to the blood pool. Here are some that are slightly enlarged. The problem with uh, PET is there's false positive, so you still need to get tissue. Um, but the PET tells us which nodes and where are the ones that should be sampled. And it's very useful if the PET is negative. It has a high negative predictive value, meaning that it's very unlikely you're going to find tumor in those nodes. And it's also very good for the M stage, the metastatic stage. We can detect distal metastasis to organs um, that are missed on CT. Pitfalls with PET-CT, there are many, and we're going to talk about some of those. Here's one um, patient was scanned, moved between the PET and the CT portion. So the activity is misregistered here adjacent to the muscle rather than where that arrow is pointing towards uh, a small lymph node. We can um, be fooled by infection and inflammation, which also are FDG avid. And we can have false negative scans, as we said already, by low metabolic tumors like carcinoid. And I'm going to show you an example of hyperglycemia, a patient scan with a elevated glucose and how that interferes. And then uh, the biggest problem is our spatial resolution is currently at about 8 millimeters. So even though on CT we can detect, detect tiny lesions on PET-CT, we're not able to characterize whether those are benign or malignant. Here's a PET CT scanner. Uh, we'll be familiar to those of you who have had one. You go through the CT portion first. I should tell you that the CT in these cases is not the same as a diagnostic CT. It's a very low dose. It's done for two reasons. 
one is so that we can fuse the pet data with it and have a better anatomic definition of where the abnormal activity is and the second is something called attenuation correction which is necessary for us to properly assign how much activity there is from the different body uh, parts the way pet works is uh, plural deoxyglucose the F18 is unstable and it wants to decay to a more stable element and it does that by emitting a positron that positron moves a few millimeters in your body and it counts an, an electron there's an annihilation event during that event two 511 keV photons are given off at 180 degrees from each other so if you're conveniently laying in a PET CT scanner when that happens and you are surrounded by a ring of detectors, we can detect that event and that's what enables us to uh, image you. Um, I want to take a, an aside here, a couple of things about PET CT that are very important for those of you that have one. The ACR, the American College of Radiology, the Society of Nuclear Medicine Imaging, and the National Cancer Institute all recommend fasting and low carbohydrate meals are also a good idea before PET CT and here is an example of why. Row of images on the left, different uh, set of images from the same patient on the bottom. This is a patient with a known tumor in the left lower lobe and this top row of images were done because the tumor shrunk on CT. We wanted to know is it still metabolically active. We can see the nodule, it's this little guy here, but on the PET it's laying next to the heart which is taking up a lot of the radio uh, tracer and we can't really tell for sure in fact you might think that this is negative this patient was scanned the same day a few hours later after fasting we didn't let them eat so now the heart activity is being depressed and lo and behold that nodule is very pet avid it's actually positive another way we can be misled is if you exercise within a day before the exam Here's a patient that's done squats, so his back and psoas muscles are lit up. And the patient on the right, you can see activity in the pecs and in the arms. He was doing push-ups before the scan. Here's another patient. Um, he looks fairly young and healthy, and you can see he spent a day in the gym the day before. And he's pretty buff. We can see his six-pack. We got his pecs. We can see pretty much all the muscle groups. No, it's not mine. Unfortunately for this patient, this was not repeated. When he came back in for surveillance imaging later and, and followed the guidelines, didn't exercise, we detect on the corner of the scan this tiny little area of activity. I'm not going to show you the fuse PET CT, but that's in a lymph node and it's positive. Now the question is, is this a node that's getting better or did we miss it on the first study because of all the muscle activity? We don't know. Um, another place that's a problem is, as you know, we like to keep you warm and calm right before we do the pet, and that's because of brown fat. Brown fat is uh, a type of fat, it's normal in your body, and it's used um, in heat production when you get cold. And uh, it can become quite metabolically active. Here's a patient showing a lot of symmetric activity in the neck, axilla, mediastinum between the ribs and in the upper retroperitoneum. Here's another patient showing symmetric activity in the neck. When you look at the CT, all that activity is in normal fat. And that's why we try to keep you warm and calm before this study. As I said, I think I said that FDG is a glucose analog, so your body is tricked into thinking it's fuel, and it tries to utilize it just like it does glucose. So it's brought into the cells, it's phosphorylated, but then your body can't break it down, and it gets stuck, and that's why we're able to image it. Here's an example of a um, altered biodistribution. This is a patient that had a uh, PET done, and it looks pretty normal. Can't really find any abnormal activity. This is all physiologic. This is activity in the kidneys, bladder. It's all supposed to be there. There's too much um, activity. Uh, I I'm sorry. There's not enough activity really in this patient's brain. It's usually a lot more active than this. And so when you check the glucose, this patient's glucose was over 350. We don't generally image you if your glucose is between, say, 2 to 220 as a cutoff. We don't want it to be any higher than that, and this is why. This patient was scanned the same day, a few hours later, with a glucose of below 100, and you can see that we are on this scan missing metastatic disease, neck, mediastinum, lung, liver, bone, pretty much everywhere you look. And so it's very misleading, and that's why 
we want your glucose to be low and why you're asked to be rescheduled if we find it too high because we don't know what we're missing on a scan like that first one what if you're hypoglycemic and you're diabetic and you get intravenous insulin here's what happens the insulin forces all that activity into your cells into your muscle and we get altered biodistribution this is obviously going to interfere with our ability to accurately interpret the PET and that's why we have such strict guidelines for diabetics when we do PET scans. We're going to lastly move on to somatostatin analogs. Um, we're going to start with indium-111 octreotide, currently in use, has been in use for many years. Here's an example of one um, showing uptake in several liver lesions, left and right lobe. These uh, scans are physiologic. They enable us to detect tumors that are otherwise occult. Can't see them on other image. They help us stage and monitor response to therapy. Indium-111 octreotide is pretty sensitive to neuroendocrine tumors. It's um, best for carcinide. But as I've shown you, we can miss liver lesions. And that's because sometimes the, act the uptake in these tumors is not any greater than the normal uptake in the liver, so they're not visible to us. Somatostatin is a regulatory hormone that your body normal normally produces and inhibits other hormones. Here's a list. I'm not going to go through them. Um, the somatostatin molecule looks like this. Here's the octreotide analog. What it does is it tries to bind to receptors. There are five types of somatostatin receptors on a cell membrane, and neuroendocrine tumors tend to have um, a couple of these types, and the somatostatin binds mostly to two, five, and a little bit to three. Nowadays, in addition to linking the radionuclide indium-111 uh, to a peptide, octreotide, and targeting those receptors, we can use gallium-68, link it uh, to octreotate, and image for receptor activity. And it turns out that the gallium-68 is really good. It has a much higher affinity for these um, uh, type 2 receptors than the indium-111 does. It's cheaper. It's faster because we only scan you once, unlike indium where you're scanned over a couple of days. And it has higher spatial resolution. Here's an example. Indium-111 scan on the left-hand side shows uptake in a lymph node in the neck, metastatic disease. This is the same patient scanned two days later with gallium. We can see, in addition to that lesion, there is metastatic disease to nodes in the axilla, neck. There are liver lesions. There are bone lesions in the spine, ribs, and throughout the pelvis. None of that is visible on the end of 111. So we're really excited that we're going to be able to offer this soon. And just like with FDG PET, we can uh, fuse the data with, C with uh, CT, and it can show us uh, lesions um, uh, anatomically registered to the correct body part if the patient doesn't move and where they are. And here's a CT in a patient showing that that lesion that we detect on the gallium pet is really not visible at all on the CT scan. Um, that was kind of a whirlwind tour, but I hope you have some idea of what imaging modalities we use and why, how useful they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how they are complementary to one another. There's really no clear winner. Um, that's why you end up with so many different scans monitoring these patients. And I think I'm just about out of time. But that was a great review. So um, so, uh, so you, let, let me just uh, say a couple things, though. So you saw that Garrett uh, presented quite a few different modalities. But now you can also see why I'm a little bit particular about how we do the imaging. And, and Garrett, attest this for me. I would say our MRI, MRI imaging has improved a lot over the past year since we started to fine tune our techniques. Yeah, they really are. And, and again, you, know, you have uh, highly trained people, not only just being highly trained in radiology, but now very highly trained in neuroendocrine. So you, know, you can see why sometimes you'll say, oh, can I have my MRI at home? And you'll hear me like hemming and hawing. It's not that I don't trust the people back home. It's just I know for sure that the stuff we do here is of, of the highest quality. Right. Right, exactly. So thanks a lot, Garrett. Uh, so one thing uh, before you ask Laura. Um, if you have any questions, do me a favor, use the cards and then give them to either me or Bob or Marianne 
and we'll collect them and we can ask them all at the Q&A session so that everyone can kind of hear it. It's a little bit, sometimes you can't hear the question from the, from the uh, audience, so let's just save them for, that, for the sessions later. Do uh, you have a quick question, Loretta? From MRI? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the radi yeah, the radiation, right. Oh, yeah, no, they've really done an amazing job now. Uh, the, mich the cameras have gotten so good that the amount of radiation that we actually see is really small. So some people are afraid of getting too many chest x-rays. I mean, that's like almost, you know, getting too many puffs of wind. You know, it's, it's so small um, compared to, say, something like PRT, which you hear about, you know, shortly, which is a therapeutic tornado, essentially. Uh, so, you know, radiation is all kind of relative and in the eye of the beholder. And, um, but, you know, for a lot of you who see me, you know that I don't try to overscan you because if I don't need to scan you, well, why even expose you to any risk? But sometimes you have to do it because the benefit's so good. So let's take a break now. So everyone come back and we're going to hear from Dr. Ryan all about pathology. Okay, see you soon. We've got 15 minutes, 1035.